Welcome to Collier's Talks, a podcast series featuring the latest trends, insights, research, and developments in commercial real estate in Canada and beyond. I would like to welcome all the listeners to Collier's Podcast, Collier's Talks, and uh, we do this one a little bit differently. Uh, It's a little bit of wine and real estate together. Uh, The first time we've actually given it a name, we're now calling it Wine and Warehouses. Uh, but we talk about more than warehouses. We do, right. absolutely. Uh, Jean-Marc Dubé, Executive v- Vice President with Colliers. Arnold Fox, Executive Vice President of Colliers. Rob Coomer, CEO, King Set. Really excited to have you here, Rob. And, Great to you know, be here. It's, uh, especially uh, in the new role, mm-hmm. and it's a bit, uh, days are full, and mm-hmm. for you to take out the time, it's really, uh, really much appreciated. You know what? Anytime you get to drink wine and talk about <laughs> warehouses, it, uh, are we allowed to tell the audience that it's like 10 in the morning? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's definitely not that a like I said. I mean, how can you turn that down? So It's 5 o'clock somewhere. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. <laughs> it's 5 o'clock somewhere. So as, as usual, this is our, our third edition of this. Uh, this podcast and I, I think we're happy to say that it's been uh, the top listen to Collier's Talks podcast uh, version one and two and I'm assuming that version three is going to be even even surpassed. We got mark. the momentum so going with we've us. We've got momentum and yeah. maybe in the world now. Right. <laughs> so what I thought we would do today is um, do a little bit of tasting of this wine that we brought. Um, Rob before we started this I, I said to you what kind of varietal, what kind of grape did you want it? And you said to me, Pinot Noir. You got it. So to me, Pinot Noir means Burgundy in France. Um, and I wanted to bring a bottle that is actually quite special. Um, it's a Carton Grand Cru, uh, which is part of the Côte de Nuit uh, side of Burgundy. Uh, of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From Domaine de Monti, uh, I ha- actually happened to visit this winery in uh, November. No, shocking, yeah. shocking. <laughs> Trip of a lifetime. <laughs> really, really uh, great, great wine, great producer. Um, it's been since 1730 that wow. this producer has been uh, has wow. been making wine. We see that a lot in Burgundy just because families have passed down and passed down and passed down. And an interesting, for just from a real estate perspective, it's difficult on the families now because the lands are so valuable that the families that are winemakers are having a hard time paying the succession taxes wow. when somebody passes away. So now we're starting to see some of the larger, uh, larger billion-dollar families in in France that are mm-hmm. actually coming in to buy these uh, Is that right? these vineyards. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I brought a couple of my favorite tools also. Uh, the wine opener I'm using right now is a La Guiole, uh from France. Okay. Here that comes out really nicely. And Beautiful. I brought us each a Zalto, which is my favorite wine glass, I mean, hand-blown in yeah, Austria. Like th- this glass, um, for those who are just listening, they can't uh, necessarily see them. They are beautiful and they're extraordinarily light. Correct. And fragile, Rob. <laughs> fragile, you know, in my clumsy hands. <laughs> but they are they are beautiful. I mean, I, even even a novice wine drinker like myself can tell these are. This yeah, they're fun. They're yeah. fun. It's it's a bit. We have a funeral every time I break one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, cheers. Cheers. So cheers, we're sorry, drinking uh, a 2019 Corton uh, Grand Cru, Le Clou du Roi, which means the the parcel for. Uh, the king, which typically meant the best parcel available. Wow. Um, so great producer and a great vintage, 2019. So just, just how many bottles of this would they produce in a year? Do you think this is this is not uh, not a ton. Uh, this is not like 50,000 bottles. This is right. probably less. I don't have the figure right in front of me, but I would say that this is probably less than 2,000 bottles okay. a year. Yeah. So for someone who's used to sort of drinking, you know, yellowtail Shiraz. Sure. Uh, this is sort of a step up. It's a little bit of a step up. Yeah, it's a little bit more complex, but... Uh, Can I, I taste it? Yeah, of course, right. guys. Go I ahead. better not laugh in my wine. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, good acidity. Yeah. It's, it's, oh, we're lovely. drinking it. Yeah, lovely. we're drinking it young, but it's going to... It's gonna. So it's this is 2019. Yeah. And in an ideal world, how, how long would this wait until you open it? And when you say we're drinking it young... 
So winemakers are making it more that we can wines are more approachable now, so right. we can drink them a bit younger. Right. right. Um, but this this because of the the tannins and acidity, we could probably hold on to this for another twenty thirty years easily. Would you typically yeah. de- uh, carafe this wine? Or? Well, look, I mean, sometimes yeah. I I me for two reasons I carafe wine. One is if it's young to help it breathe a little bit and mm-hmm. soften some of those tannins, mm-hmm. uh, or if it's an older wine where you need to filter it out, but. Mm-hmm. You know the the thought of decanting a wine just because it's an expensive wine that's mm-hmm. uh, that's not not how we uh, passe. That's yeah, passe. it's not how we roll. So right. I hear you. Well, this is beautiful. Yeah. I, well, listen, thanks for coming again. Um, my pleasure. It really is my pleasure. Thank you. So I think congratulations are in order. Uh, you've taken on a a, a big role, a mm-hmm. uh, very important role for mm-hmm. uh, Kingset Capital. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you could start off by giving us a little bit of. Who is Kingset Capital? Like, if I think Kingset Capital, what should we be thinking? Well, thank, first of all, thank you. Um, you know, it's a big role. It's a lot of responsibility, and I and I don't take that lightly. Um, it's a it's a you know it's quite an honor to be able to take over the leadership position of a company that has you know amazing an amazing track record. Um, it's a big business. It's a broad business. Uh, there's a lot of complexity to it, but we have established. Um, relationships with our stakeholders that are extraordinary and the support that we've got um, really is quite humbling and uh, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to, to, to help lead you know our business into the next phase. Um, when you think about Kingset, we are a private equity real estate investment business at its very core and all that means is we're raising private pools of capital to invest in all forms of real estate across, in our case, across Canada. The, the 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 business is is comprised of a number of funds that when you think of them or if you were to plot them on a, on a on a graph with with risk and return, um, they would span the whole graph, and so our goal is to come up with investment theses to say okay, um, you know we're missing sort of this this quadrant of the graph or we're missing a quadrant down here in the graph, and so it's to come up with different fund strategies to cover the whole graph. So ultimately, you can look at Kingset and say. In a one-stop shop kind of way, we can be your Canadian real estate solution. So if you're looking for an investment strategy in real estate, you can look at our business and find a home for your capital. And so that could be on the credit side, could be on the equity side, it could be opportunity strategy, which is perhaps a little higher risk, higher return, higher volatility. It could be on the core side, you're buying income, you know, institutional quality income producing assets, a little lower risk, lower volatility. Credit side, obviously, even lower lower risk, lower volatility. And then within those sides of the business, credit and equity, you've got all different, you know, varieties of strategies. So you've got development, you've got affordable housing, you have urban, you have, you know, we do all different asset classes, all parts of the capital stack in every market across the country. So again, it comes back to we can be your one-stop shop for real estate solutions in Canada. If you are a counterparty, so if you're a joint venture partner or if you're an investor or a seller uh, or a lender um, and you're looking for a counterparty, a capital partner of some kind, uh, we can be that too. So if you are buying a building and you need a slug of capital, we can hopefully find a place for you in our world. And our job when we are evaluating opportunities that are brought to us by potential partners uh, ultimately is to be the best partner you know you have so that when you find another deal you come back to us and you come back to us again so a big part of our business is through the joint venture relationships that we've established and cultivated over the course of 20 years so that sort of gives you a snapshot of who we are uh, today we're 160 people most of whom are in Toronto we've got a small office here in Montreal we have right. a small office in Vancouver um, and we cover the country that way um, and, uh, and, and that's sort of, that gives you a snapshot of who we are in a nutshell. So is Kingset staying in the core markets or are you also going into some of the secondary tertiary markets within Canada? Um, we do everything. So, uh, the lion's share of our business is in Toronto. Uh, it's just sort of played out that way. It wasn't always the case today. It is, um, but that will ebb and flow over time, but we are in all the markets. We are in, uh, you know, one of our largest assets in our core fund is in Saskatoon. Uh, one of, uh, you know, we have a, a portfolio of, of apartment buildings through this middle of Canada. 
Canada. We have an office building in Winnipeg. We've got a portfolio. We've owned large portfolios uh, in Halifax. Um, we've done a lot of business here in Montreal. Uh, lots of business, obviously, in Toronto. Some business in, in Vancouver. Lighter in Vancouver because it, it's been a tougher market to penetrate. We're making some because, headway there. Because of costs? You know, Vancouver's a bit of a tricky market. It's, um, it's always priced... You know, you really have to be able to wrap your mind around the pricing in Vancouver. There always seems to be, for someone who's outside looking in, a price premium to be in Vancouver. Now, those who are in Vancouver will tell you, well, liquidity and volatility uh, is lower. Liquidity is higher. Volatility, Volatility is lower in Vancouver, and therefore it justifies a pricing premium. Probably... There's parts of that that are probably right. But as an outsider looking in, when you weigh that against opportunities in Toronto or, you know, or elsewhere, you really have to have conviction. And so if you're not an insider in Vancouver, it's, a, it's, a t- it's an insular market. Not, not dissimilar from, from Montreal. Uh, Montreal's an insular market too, right? And it's hard for outsiders mm-hmm. to penetrate uh, the market here. So you need operating partners. Uh, you need, you know, local operating partners goes a long way. Uh, you need experience, and ultimately, you need conviction. And the conviction part, without being on the ground for a long period of time, the conviction part is the hardest of that puzzle to put together. Well, it's funny because I actually consider Kingset to be an early adopter uh, of Montreal, of the Greater Montreal area. Um, because, you know, we've been doing this for long time mm-hmm. and it was a very local market mm-hmm. very few players coming in from from toronto mm-hmm. or from outside of quebec mm-hmm. and king set was you know i remember when i started in the business mm-hmm. 20, call it 20 years ago and funny enough i didn't mention it before but the first time you and i met mm-hmm. was when king set had acquired 555 lee mm-hmm. uh yeah. in beta Urfe. and i, I was trying that, to forget that one yeah <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, you're very welcome. Have another sip. Yeah, I'll take another sip of my wine. <laughs> Put some water in my wine. Wow. Right out of the gate, we're bringing up 555 Lee. Yeah. Just for the, audience's, uh, for the audience's education. So that's an industrial building in Bay Durfe. Uh, that was one of the first deals I did. That would have been right around like 05 maybe, like 04, 05, like that. Exactly. So exactly. I started at Kingside in 04, 20 years ago. So we would have, you know, met each other right at the early yep. onset of, of, of both of our tenures. Um, and so so when I got to when I got to Kingset in 04, we had uh, already acquired Plaster Canada, office building downtown. Okay. Uh, Candorel was managing that for us. We ultimately sold that to Credit Suisse a few years later, and that was a, you know, a good pass and great building. Um, we owned Place, uh, Place de Royaume in Chicoutimi, regional mall in Chicoutimi, um, which was also, you know, a good spin. U- ultimately, uh, had, a, had a whole redevelopment of that property plan. 20 Vic was the manager. Um, had a whole redevelopment and expansion of that property all planned and ready to go. We ultimately sold that property to, to Primaris uh, at the time, which was a, which was uh, before the H&R days, but Primaris. Um, and they did a great job with it. Uh, so, so we had done, you know, some things in, in Montreal. And then when I came on, we bought uh, 555 Lee. Uh, before that, we had bought a building on Cousins, an industrial, a small industrial building on Cousins, about 100,000 square feet. And that was, that went okay. Uh, Terrarium Shopping Center uh, in, uh, in uh, Saint Laurent. Uh, was it Saint Laurent or Point Claire in Point yep. Claire? Um, so we had done a lot of things here. And, 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 you know, John's, history through Oxford had done a lot of, so, so there's a lot of experience in Montreal, a lot of relationships here. Um, when I got to King Set, no one was really covering Montreal. So they sort of said to me, they said, okay, Coomer, you go cover Montreal. So I was coming here, you know, a lot. I was here every couple of weeks, spending a few days and, you know, surveying the market and trying to find things to do. And, and so, you know, Cousins was one, Terrarium was one, uh, Bay Durfe, uh, 555 Lee came up. And, uh, you know, that was, of all the deals we did, uh, we, bought a, we bought a piece of land on the, on the, on the T-can uh, with Broccolini, which didn't go perfect. Not, not because of Broccolini's fault, it was just not, not great timing. But, but Lee was just a deal that I would love to take back. You know, not, not, it was just bad, it was a bad buy. Um, we couldn't lease it. It was actually a pretty functional building. I don't really under, I still to this day don't really understand it. High clear heights, really. It was occupied by, by, a, uh, by ball packaging. That's right. They were the vendor. 
And uh, they loved it because it had high ceilings and they didn't rack their product because they did cans, like soup cans and pop cans and stuff like that. So they would stack their product just on top of each other. They didn't need racking. So the high ceilings really worked well for them. Um, so we bought it. I think it even had rail access. Yeah, it and, did. You know, it like tr shipping was good. Clear height was good. Like everything was good. And then we bought it. Ball left. They were, it was, you know, they were selling it empty because they were closing up shop. And it sat for, I don't know, I mean, it was years we couldn't find a tenant in there. And ultimately, we sold it to, uh, God bless him, Richard Stern. That's right. And, uh, you know, Richard doesn't, you know, to his credit, to Richard's credit, and I, he, maybe he'll listen to this, I don't know. <laughs> but this is nothing I wouldn't we'll say to him. Sure yeah, to make sure he does. Yeah, make sure he does. You know, to Richard's credit, you know, he grinds you. And uh, he doesn't overpay for anything, you know, because he's so damn smart. Uh, and he bought it from us and he got a good deal on it. And I think like within an hour of signing the papers, he had a tenant in there and, and he was making well, money. Funny enough, it ended up trading again Did it? Uh, because there was an option to purchase at a fixed price in the, uh, in the tenants, uh, mm. the tenants lease. And I, they weren't at, where the market is now. I think you guys were just before your time. Because... We were maybe a little before our time. It was a little West at the time. Right. Bay Durfee was a little West. It was a little on the edge. We were sort of pioneering and, you know, Saint Laurent, very strong. Point Claire, strong. You know, all that was strong. And then, but as you got to the western part of the Western Island, um, you know, things just softened. Yep. And uh, I think you're, you know, I'd like to. That's a good description. We were too early. We were just, we were too visionary. You know, we just saw it before too far in advance of everybody else seeing it. Oh, I like that gosh. term, too visionary. Uh, too very, <laughs> too visionary. You were, you were. Um, Early adopters, and you know, Maybe so early it. adopters are going to make uh, you know you're going to get your feet wet and yeah. test some things. But yeah, so so most of the stuff but, that we've done, yeah, sorry, yeah, ultimately sorry. you were right. Ultimately, I was right, and you know, it's sort of like the Reichmans in Canary Wharf. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you know, Richard did well, I'm sure, with the even with the fixed price option, and uh, you know, so it's nice to know we left some money on the table for him, and uh, God bless him. So that gives us a bit of insight on King Set and how you guys invest uh, both on the lender side and on the investment side across mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about Rob Coomer now. What, what's a bit of your background and how did you get to to the, the position you are now? I mean, you're taking over also from what we consider a legend. a legend. He is a legend. Yeah, I think you use the term... Uh, a nice Bill Belichick. <laughs> yeah, and, and let me tell you, like, if John was here, he'd be so embarrassed if, if we called him a legend. I mean, right. I, you know, because he just doesn't think of himself that way. But uh, he really is, in my mind at least, a legend. I think in the minds of a lot of others. Um, and it's big shoes to fill. There's no question. I mean, he casts a long shadow, John. And so it's not it's not uh, for the faint of heart. Um my, my, my history is pretty straightforward. I mean, I was born and raised in Toronto. Uh, I went to school in London, Ontario, so two hours down the highway, so not far. I came back. Uh, I graduated from business school in, in, in 99, spring of 99. I came back to Toronto immediately and started working in real estate. I, I took a job with uh, a, real, a shopping center development business uh, called North American Development Group. They're still around today. Uh, some people might know them as Center Corp, but today they're, they're called North American. Really good guys, and we still do business with them today. Um, and I was there for two years. Ultimately, uh, the subsidiary that I worked for uh, at that time was taken over in a, in a publicly, in a in sort of a public take in, a, in an M and A deal. It was taken over by what is now First Capital. So at the time, it was Gazette, uh, Dory Siegel, and that whole crew, and and they you know bought the business. Uh, and and when that all went down for a, a, a number of sort of reasons we don't have to go into, I was I was let go. The business was basically closed down, wound up. Uh, I was let go uh, from that business, which in hindsight, you know, was a really good thing because it for, sort of forced me to reevaluate, you know, what I was doing and, and, it, and it forced me to think about where I wanted to go. Um, from there, I took a job as an investment analyst at RioCan. And RioCan, so I started there in 2000. And uh, RioCan was in a phenomenal experience. I was there for four years. Uh, basically doing buying and selling of retail assets of shopping centers and it was a it was a period of amazing growth at Riacan. so when i got there in 2000 we were about a billion dollar business when when i left there in 04 it was about a four or five billion dollar business so lots of growth 
lots of deals, just deal after we were just acquiring and acquiring and acquiring. And, and, and the investment team was fairly small. It was just me and, and a couple other analysts and that was it. So, um, you know, tons of underwriting, tons of deals, meeting lots of people, uh, lots of experience. It was, it was really quite intense, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, in 2004, I left Rio Can, and and really, you know, I had one thing that I I've done, you know, reasonably well over the course of my career is I've always taken opportunities to step back and say, like, how am I liking what I'm in, what I'm doing? Am I learning? Am I growing? Am I evolving? And what does the next sort of few years look like? And and is it worth sticking around? You know, for lack of a better for lack of a better expression. And four years into Rio Can, I just felt like my growth had sort of plateaued there. For no fault of the business or the environment or anyone in particular, it was just I had sort of just grown a little bored of what I was doing. And so I went out, basically, I went out looking for a new job. And uh, I came across Kingset. Now, when I, went, when I went out looking for a job, you know, I had a sort of a checklist of things that I wanted. I wanted to get back to a business that was entrepreneurial by nature, right. smaller more entrepreneurial. It had gone from when I started maybe 30 or 40 people to by the time I left, it was about 400 people. So it had internalized all of its operations. It had internalized property management, construction, leasing, development, all this stuff. So so Rhea can have become quite impressive. I mean, and to this day, I mean, it's a phenomenal business. But often what happens as companies grow is that individual roles tend to, can narrow. You know, if it's not done properly, roles for people and specifically can become narrower and narrower. Whereas and you'd be able to touch a lot of yeah, stuff. Yeah, when I started, it was like you're sort of moving and shaking. You know, you're one of 30. You get to sort of do a whole bunch of things and interact with a whole bunch of people and get exposed to a whole bunch of different things. And that's a lot of fun. As the company gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, your role becomes more and more specific. That's generally how things evolve in the corporate world. So by the time I left, my role was quite, you know, I was underwriting and underwriting and underwriting. Right. And underwriting, you know, like all the was, fun stuff. Oh, yeah, but it, I mean, it was great training, but it wasn't it wasn't intellectually, you know, stimulating for me. So I wanted to get back to something entrepreneurial. I wanted to get out of retail. I had done retail for at that point six years, and I wanted to sort of see other asset classes and you know that kind of thing. And I came across Kingset, and um, you know, I met John, and there were two other partners that started the business with him uh, in two thousand and two. Uh, Peter Agar, uh, who's doing his own thing now, and Stu Legier, who's also doing his own thing. Sure. Um, uh, both terrific guys. And, and obviously, I met John. And, and, and it was like, it was exactly what I was looking for. I mean, it was a, it was a small business. I was employee probably number eight or nine like that. Um, they had raised one fund. It was a $220 million private equity fund. It was an opportunity, the opportunity fund strategy uh, with institutional investors. John's and Stu, you know, to some extent, Stu and Peter's reputation, but, but particularly John's uh, brand was, you know, extraordinary. You, you know, we used the word uh, legendary, you know, did we use that word? It was a legend. 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 Yeah, legend or legendary. You know, like John, John, who I didn't know before this, um, you know, like, he was a, he was a rock star. So, um, and when I met John uh, and had my interview with him uh, for the very first time, you got it immediately. Like you under you know you get to you, you know you when you meet people and they just give you that spark, you know. And he was one of those guys. Um, and I could just tell that this was going to be something special. And I remember I didn't realize it at the time. I was in my twenties. Uh, he was 49, so he was very young. Uh, he was my age now, okay? Um, yeah. So so looking back, it's ridiculous to think, but at the time when I met him, uh, I asked him, I said, how long are you going to be around? <laughs> how long are you going to be around? <laughs> Which upon reflection is so is so ridiculous. But I, the one thing I was worried about at the time was that like John, this was sort of like a play thing for John. That John had been so successful at Oxford, you know, he had had such a good run. He was sort of doing this. It was felt start up ish, like Kingset was sort of start up ish, which is part of what I loved about it, but also part of what made me nervous. Anyway, John, you know, made it very clear that this was like he had big ambitions for this thing. Uh, so I just felt like this is a great, this is going to be a great spot. So I was fortunate enough that they offered me the job. There's a long-winded story to a short question, but they offered me the job. I started as an analyst. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, um, a lateral move. So I was coming from Rio as an analyst. I started Kingside as an analyst. 
Um, but I just felt like the runway was a lot longer. If you had asked me the time, if you had asked me in 2004 how long I'd be at Kingside, I probably would have told you like three, four years because I just come off four years at Reagan. You thought it was going to be a stepping stone. I thought it, I thought everything was a stepping stone. Right. You know, you're in your 20s, like sure. four years feels like a long time. So, you know, but here I am 20 years later. And John has done a remarkable job over the years of keeping me engaged. And I think for a number of us, but but for me in particular, keeping me engaged. My job has grown, has broadened, has evolved. Uh, the team is amazing. The management team that we've put in place now, there's 12 of us between the executive committee and the and the second level of, of strategic leadership team. Um, you know, that group of people is phenomenal. The, the balance of the organization is extraordinary. Uh, people are great. There's an intensity. There's an entrepreneurial spirit. There is a drive and an ambition um, that really is intoxicating. And so for me, 20 years later, I'm sticking around because every day I go in the office and I can't believe my good fortune. Well, it's funny because even I think, you know, we've talked about it before. We're, we've had a lot of dealings with King Set and I think Collier's is a big fan of King Set and vice versa, I hope. Um, and all of our dealings with King Set have had that entrepreneurial spirit, uh, a real can do uh, atmosphere when you're trying to do a transaction, whether it's on the leasing side, uh, acquisition or disposition side. So it's it really it really does does come through. You know, it's it's the core of what we try to accomplish, and you know, it really is all about at the end of the day, combining um, an entrepreneurial mindset and an entrepreneurial attitude with what we'd call institutional rigor, sophistication, scale. Um, and ultimately that's a pretty compelling combination. If you can figure out how to do that successfully and we've, for the time being, figured it out. Um, if you can figure that out, it, you know, there's really no stopping you because if you can have the scale, the competitive advantage of scale relationships, um, and, and combine it with agility, uh, and, and, and a reaction time that you don't find in the institutional world very much. Agreed. Um, well, you it's know, hard to do. There, it's very hard to do. Um, and it's, it's very hard to replicate. So, you know, we've got it and that's not just from us. That's not because we're so great. It's because we have amazing support from our stakeholders. Uh, like we our, our investors, our service providers, our advisors, our, you know, our brokers, uh, our lenders. Um, it's really the whole food chain top to bottom. And all of these stakeholders are, are melded into one big pot. And, uh, and that's what comes out the other end. And it takes everybody. Because if we had, for example, a big deal where we had to put together a lot of capital and get it done, and you could very easily get held up in approvals and you know, uh, board approvals and then investment committees and, and all that sort of stuff. Part of the reason we can act quickly is because our stakeholders have allowed us some rope. You know, they've given us some leeway and they're they're pretty good, with, not pretty good, they're extraordinary with us. We can go for a board approval and get an answer like, I hate to say it, but like in under an hour, you know, I can send out an email for an approval. But that's a trust factor. Yeah, that's, totally that's, is a tr it's that's a trust based factor. on history. It's based on history. It's based on trust. It's based on all these things. So, that, but it goes two ways. A, we don't abuse it. So right. we, that to us is the holy grail. Like we don't take that for granted and we have to remind ourselves and I, you know, we have to remind our team and ourselves every day that we go into the office that that can get taken away in an instant. And we have to fight every single day for the trust, the confidence, um, and, and, you know, like from our stakeholders to, to get all that stuff done. But ultimately we can't act if our stakeholders don't allow us to act. So, so they're giving us the flexibility to do that. They're granting us the leeway. They're giving us, you know, the flexibility and the rope to go do that. And without that, it all falls apart. The lenders, you know, will, we can go into, uh, you know, our key, our key lenders offices, talk through a deal get a handshake done. You know, we can, we can understand very quickly. Can we get this? Can we get the credit for this? Can't we get the, how do we get the credit? What do we have to change? You know, those kinds of processes in our stakeholder groups. I mean, that's the secret sauce, right? It's not us. Anyone can do what we're doing. It's, it's the, it's what's happening behind the scenes in our, with our lenders. When we call our lawyers, they pick up the phone, they act, they put a team, you know, we need a team on it. They put a team on it. We need our lenders. They, they, we need an approval. They go get an approval. They need to tell, we need them to tell us what's possible. What's the art of the possible. They tell us what's the art of the possible. You know, it's, 
the brokers. We need to get a hold of colliers to get a deal done. We need you to make a phone call to somebody. We need you to tell us, that, you know, like we need market intelligence. You guys call us back. I mean, it's all of that. It's all of that secret sauce that goes into it that really creates the end product. We're just here, you know, we're like air traffic controllers, right. you know, we're trying to listen, we're trying to collect information, we're trying to come up with ideas and so on. But ultimately, we need everybody else to cooperate with us in order to get stuff done. And that's been really, you know, the secret to behind getting it all done. So maybe to pivot a little bit and and kind of se- segue, because being an entrepreneurial company or, or a company of entrepreneurial spirit, institutional size, there there are things that could that could hinder that entrepreneurial spirit and maybe i'm i'm not using the right words but mm-hmm. like esg mm-hmm. so esg is on everybody's lips um coming from lenders to occupiers mm-hmm. it's very important issue also the work from home working from office mm-hmm. all of that that stuff that is happening right now that's a real reality how's that affecting your business so um, ESG, we tend to look at a little differently, I think, than what you might read about it in either the newspapers or on websites and so on. Um, first of all, we, we really boil ESG down to um, sustainability is a big part of it. Um, and, and we're really focused on zero carbon. So like when we distill ESG down, I mean, the governance part of ESG is sort of table stakes. And we all, you know, we have good governance. I'm sure Colliers has good governance. I mean, governance is sort of, we've all been doing it. There's ways to document it now that perhaps weren't around a little while ago, but we've all been doing the governance stuff. We're focused on zero carbon. And that doesn't hinder us. If anything, zero carbon has been an enormous opportunity for us. And for example, um, we were well we're well ahead of the market uh, in terms of um, zero carbon certifications within our office portfolio in particular. We recognized a number of years ago that this is where the world was going. Uh, ultimately, lenders, tenants, buyers, uh, developers, they're all going to focus on this. And, and there will come a time in Canada, it's already happening in other parts of the world, there will come a time in Canada where you can't sell or lease an office building if you're not zero carbon. Right. So we're going there, whether you want to admit it or not. So for us, I don't look at zero carbon as really something that was an impediment to opportunity. That was the opportunity itself. And so we are in the middle now of decertify or certifying uh, our office portfolio is zero carbon. We're part of the way through that. We're going, you know, we're going to go further and we'll be mostly certified by 2027. So we're not setting deadlines of 20. 20- 35 or 2050, like our federal government, where, you know, no one's going to remember and no one who's setting the deadline today is going to be around. Or unachievable deadlines. Well, forget about whether it's achievable or not, but the, no one's going to be held accountable. So no right. one really cares. It's easy to set a deadline if you're never going to be held accountable. We're setting a deadline of 2027. So like it's, you know, just it's around the corner. Now, it's around the corner. So we're on our way and we're investing heavily in our assets to get that done. Um, we we uh, certified the Royal York Hotel zero carbon. I mean, that was a $65 million capital investment. And, and we're not doing it because we're trying to save the world. We're doing it because we think there's an economic reward for doing it. And there is a pro forma return uh, that we think will generate, you know, an economic return to our stakeholders that is worthwhile. Um, and we're seeing it. So, um, for example, at Scotia Plaza, we have now, you know, there's a, there are a number of tenants in Scotia Plaza today that are in Scotia Plaza because it's zero carbon. And we would not have leased space anywhere else in the city. You know, there's no other AAA office building in Toronto that's zero carbon. I did so, not know that. Yeah. So if you are a brand looking for AAA space in Toronto and you have in your mandate zero carbon footprint. You're it. There's only, you know, you can go to 100 Young, which we own, that's attached to Scotia Plaza or Scotia Plaza, and that's it. There's no other office building you can go to. Um, even the new buildings that are under construction aren't zero carbon because they were all designed 10 years ago or, you know, seven years ago or whatever it is. Um, so there's, you know, it's a, re- so again, coming back to your question, I don't look at it as, a, as an impediment or a challenge. It's the, that is the opportunity and, and we're facing it head on. We're spending the money where we think it's going to generate an economic return. And ultimately that's going to be a huge competitive advantage for us, uh, as the market continues to evolve, to demand it from landlords. So great insights on King said and your vision and the team and that. So I, I think what we'd like to do is get your thoughts now about where the commercial real estate market is in Canada, 
where it's going, where what some of your ideas. But before we do that, mm -hmm. I would suggest that we take another sip of uh, sure. of this uh, carton because it's been sitting in our glass for a little bit. Yes. Probably opened up a little bit. Yeah, no, notice the twirl, huh? Yeah, I know. I, I can try to replicate the twirl, but I'm not. It's a, a, a years of uh, years the, of the practice. wrist action is quite, years of practice. It's quite extraordinary. It is beautiful. It's beautiful yeah. wine. It's wonderful. It really is. Yeah. Nice. It really so is. So when I was, I happened to have dinner with Etienne de Monti, who's the, the owner. He's name dropping. And, of course. Yeah. He's name of dropping. Course. But more importantly <laughs> is we actually went, his sister has a restaurant in Burgundy. Um, who, who doesn't? Yeah. Of course. Right. Of course she does. <laughs> and we, uh, we, had a, we had a beautiful dinner. There. Only one <laughs> restaurant? Only she one. She only has one? Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, you'd be surprised that we, we, we have this vision of, of uh, you know, especially if you go to California, these mm -hmm. big, big, uh, large, beautiful mm -hmm. tasting rooms mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. That's not Burgundy. Burgundy, you go to taste there often. You're either tasting in the in the winemaking room. Really? Or you're going into the cellars where you've got moss growing and there's, really? you know, Bottles sitting there that have been sitting there for a hundred years. It's a, it's a, it's a really interesting. Uh, so I've done I the recommend it. I've done the the Napa Valley yeah. thing. You know, it's great. It, it, it's great. It's great. Um, you know, I don't. I, I felt as though it was it, uh, two days into it. You know, it, it becomes a little salesy for me. Sure. Right. There's a big sales pitch. There's a lot of pressure. I felt like uh, to buy stuff. I don't know if that's typically what people find or not, but I found it. They, I, I, it was great for a day or two. They want you to become a member of their wine club. A lot of that. A lot, of that. a lot yeah. of that. And they're very, they're very compelling. Like sure. they're very compelling. And you, and the wine tastes better in Napa, I think, than it does. You know, when you bring it home, like it's, it's a very seductive. It's a under very seductive environment under the California sun. It yeah, makes a, yeah, a, a it definitely is. a seductive environment. So, so my, you know, my experience with wine is, and I, I have a pretty good existence with wine because, I, as I, you can tell, I don't know a lot about wine. I love good wine. I do love good wine. I don't know a lot about it because I haven't taken the time really to educate myself. But everyone I know thinks I know a lot about wine. You know, they, they. I'm not quite sure why, but they think I'm an aficionado. Of wine so when i have people at to my house either for dinners or for you know like when we have guests and we have we my wife and i entertain a lot people bring me extraordinary wine <laughs> they bring me extraordinary because they think you know they think i know like they think that if they showed we'll up there with weekend. something yeah. not, so so i have a lot of good wine in my house it's it's quasi organized um and i love drinking it so i, I i'm never shy about opening i really don't i don't selectively open up wine like sure. if there's something that someone wants we open it so i love drinking good wine i think it's um uh, it's really additive to the dinner experience to, to meal experience and to social experience um that you know like it's i am quite fortunate because people have they tend to bring me amazing wine and that's really what my house is stocked with it's just gifts <laughs> well it's funny because i actually think wine i i see wine more as food uh, Interesting. I, I really do. Like, I don't see it as a as a drinking experience. I right. see it more as a a pleasure experience. Right. The same that I would have eating a great bowl of pasta. Right. Um, and you I, you chase it, and that's the problem with wine is that once you 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 start getting into those yes. levels, you yes. it's hard to go back. Yes, it is hard to go back. It's you definitely back. can taste better yeah. wine. I yeah. think. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. And um, I we were talking about the Corvin before we started because sure. because you, you tested this bottle before you didn't want to you didn't want to embarrass yourself. But so I use the Corvin at home because my wife doesn't drink wine. So like if I ever want to have a glass of wine at my house and I don't have other people around me, I got I got to use the Corvin. So it changed my whole experience because in the old days you know you used to crack the wine and then I'd throw yeah, out the, the bottle, the cork at the top, yeah, and, you yeah, know yeah. a day later it's it's shot right. A couple of days later it's shot. So for those who don't know, Corvin is basically a, a, a unit that goes on top of the bit, which right. sends an inert gas into the bottle and allows you to pour yourself a, a, yeah. a glass without having to affect the quality of the wine. And the wine- It's a phenomenal- For months yeah, later. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing- There's a professor, uh, I believe it was a professor from MIT who loved having great wine, right. but only wanted to have one glass at right. a time. And right. he's the inventor of the- Yeah, uh, the so it Corvin. changed my whole experience yeah. with wine. That, We've that, never that had to thing. use that. I have two of them, and uh, unfortunately, the gas lasts a long time. So. 
<laughs> so to get back to uh, to some real estate discussions, um, I mean, look, I think if we were going to start talking about the market right now, I think interest rates are probably a good place to start. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, we we're all aware that we've we've had historic uh, rises in interest rates, not no historic interest rates, but historic rises where we've never seen anything like this. It's had a lot of effect on all aspects, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, not only uh, just from talking from the industrial market, it's not just the real estate gets affected. People are not consumer buying, behavior. Consu- they're not buying, uh, no. even from the industrial occupiers are no longer buying inventory because right. they buy inventory on interest rate. Uh, right. Sure. Loans. Now, yeah, loans, yeah, loans uh, yeah. uh, inventory, inventory machinery is, is there's really, it's put an absolute halt. Want to get your perspective, especially from, you know, Kingset does both. You're both investing and you're lending. So mm-hmm. how, how has that affected your business? And what's your view on the general economy? Yeah. So, I mean, it's affected everything. And and just to go back to your to your comments, I mean, the interest rate story um, or policies that we've seen unfold over the last 12 months or 18 months is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. So it's slowing, it's just slowing everything down. And that was their intention and that's what's unfolding. And so it's, it's happening in real time and, and everyone's now just absorbing it. And I think the error, if I could rewind the clock or look back on what the narrative was when interest rates started moving up dramatically, I think the one mistake that everyone has made and continues to make is the pace at which behavior reacts. So I remember sitting, this was probably like fall of 22, towards the end of 22, you know, I was at a dinner with one of the bank chief economists. It was a small dinner. It was probably 15 of us. And, and as a guest, they brought the chief economist of one of the big banks who had a, a prediction that was in line with all the other economists of the big banks. So it wasn't, he wasn't an outlier that, you know, interest rates were going to go up, inflation would come down, inf- interest rates would come down. And this was all going to unfold over the course of like eight months or 12 months, right? Which, which felt instinctively to me as being a little too optimistic. But, you know, like, what do I know? I think, you know, as we've, as we now look back, I I think that was the error that everyone made that interest rates would go up, inflation would come down, interest rates would come down, everything would just return back to where we saw it, or perhaps not as far back to where we saw it, you know, 24, 36 months ago, but they would, everything would revert to sort of a normal environment, quote unquote. And what we've actually seen is that consumer behavior, while it has changed and continues to change, it's a lot stickier than we thought, right? right. So, so everything's just sticking around longer. Plus, you've got you've got ex- extraneous factors that continue to play itself out. You've got a war in Ukraine that you know you've got now ships being bombed in the in in the in the Suez Correct. Canal, and you've got you know you've got all these things going on that add to inflation or have effects you know that are that are outside of what interest rates are meant to be doing. So, so. You know, there's lots of things. The point is, there's lots of things at play. It's not like you just raise interest rates, inflation comes down, you lower interest rates, and we're all back normal. Everything is just taking longer to unfold. Everything is taking longer to evolve. And so we find ourselves now, you know, years into this, like almost, you know, two years into this, and we're still not where we sort of want to be or thought we would be months ago. Um, And that's just the harsh reality of it. That all said, we're on our way. Agreed. We're on our way. And, you know, everything's moving in the right direction. And, um, you know, some could argue that if you took out housing related costs from the Canadian inflation numbers, we're already there. I mean, you know, there's lots of yes. numbers circulating inflation, core inflation, inflation X housing, inflation X autos, inflation X energy. Like, there's lots of ways of looking at it. You can slice and dice it any way you want. If you, I think the Bank of Canada said they have 12 different metrics they look at, right, on any given, at any given meeting to try to figure out what they want to do. So there's lots of stuff you can look at. The point is directionally, it's indisputable, okay? Like it's 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 working. Whatever it is they're doing is working. And I give credit to the central bank that I think has a really tough job. They're trying to rein in, you know, a fairly sticky a fairly sticky variable like inflation um, in a tough world that has been flooded with liquidity for the course of three years was flooded with liquidity through the pandemic and so on in an unprecedented level. So they're dealing with an unprecedented event in perhaps an unprecedented fashion. But to their credit, I think Macklem is playing a really good game of poker because he's not wavering from what his from what his goal That's is. That's for sure. He's just every meeting he goes out there, and, and they they you know they're 
pinning the question on him, like, when are we going to get there? And he's just saying he's not wavering. 2%, 2%, 2%. And he's really tough to read. And everyone is sort of saying, like, geez, I wish he would just give us, like, just an inkling that he's going to cut the rates in April or cut the rates in June or cut the, you know, and he's not doing it. And I think as frustrating as that might be, it's probably the right strategy. It's probably the right because it becomes less political. It becomes less really... political. Let's just get there. Right. And I don't know whether that's going to be in June, September. It might be in February of next year. Maybe it's in the summer of next year. I don't know. But the point is we'll get there. In the meantime, let's focus as a real estate business, let's focus on all the things we can control. So what is that? Well, it's leasing, I mean, by and large, it's leasing space. Agreed. It's asset selection. So if you have assets in your portfolio that don't fit your long-term strategy, maybe you should sell them. Or if you want to find assets that do fit your long-term strategy, go out and find them. Um, lease space, invest strategically in the capital side of your of your business. So if you are going zero carbon, go do that. If you have to um, create amenity spaces in your office buildings, go do that. If you have to upgrade your shopping malls to find customers, go do that. You know, if you have to, uh, you know, in install a rooftop deck in your apartment building to get tenants, go do that. Like, go do all the strategic things at the asset level um, that real estate businesses should be doing day to day. Like, that's the ground war that is real estate. The valuation side of things, which is really what we're talking about when we're we talking talking. about yeah. uh, interest rates, the valuation side of real estate will ebb and flow with a whole bunch of things, including interest rates. And ultimately, it's out of the control of the owner. So, you know, look, it's been a bumpy, it was a very bumpy 23. I think it's going to be a bumpy 24. I think we're going to, you know, if you're asking me my opinion, I think we'll see rates, you know, come down, start to come down some point this year, probably mid-year, maybe late in the year. I think we'll have a strong finish to 24. But I'm really not focused on it. I'm focused, I think, and, and I'm trying, and not I'm trying, our organization is focused on all the nuts and bolts of operating the real estate you know, regardless of what the interest rate story and what the appraisers tell us each quarter our assets are worth. I don't, I'm using this term lightly, I don't care what the assets are worth. My, our job is to build income, build income, lease the space, you know, make our buildings zero carbon, make the buildings the best buildings in their market, the most competitive buildings in their market, so that when a tenant is looking for space, they pick our building. Do all the things at the asset level, um, you know, be the best landlord you can be. You know, make sure your tenants are happy. Um, you know, like do all those things right. The valuation side, it'll take care of itself. Ultimately, you know, it will stabilize. And you know, the, 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 so there's so that's that's my view on the interest rate story. The fundamental underpinning of of my optimism, and I and I am really optimistic about where Canada is going generally, uh, is founded on um, or is based on. Um, you know, a couple of big macro tailwinds that I think we have that are undeniable. I think um, the population growth story in Canada For sure. is, you know, we're, the, we're growing faster than any other country in the G7. Now, you can argue about whether we're, we got the right people or the wrong people or whether we should be letting more construction workers in or more nurses in. Like, you can make those arguments, and, and those are all healthy arguments to have, and, 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 and I'm not the expert. Um, but at the end of the day, as population grows that places more demand on all forms of real estate. Everybody who gets here needs a place to live, a place to work, a place to shop, you know, like, so there's all those great things happening. Um, we have a very strong financial system. So our banks, our big banks are, despite the fact they're highly regulated, they're also highly consolidated. They got great balance sheets. There's lots of liquidity. They're stable. So they, they provide a very sound foundation to the real estate business because it, it trades off the financial system. That's a huge tailwind for Canadian real estate. Um, we are uh, seen increasingly these days as a beacon of stability. So, you know, there's... Um, a lot of investors around the world are looking to Canada more and more as a place to place capital in lieu of wherever it is they historically or traditionally place capital. Europeans are looking at the geopolitical events unfolding there and saying, you know, I don't know if the Russia-Ukraine war stops in Ukraine. Like, that's a legitimate concern. Imagine that. As, as, as devastating a statement as that is, um, the reality is that Europeans are now saying, if it, I have to protect some portion of my capital, and I've got to look for somewhere else to place it. Asians are saying, you know, China isn't the 
isn't the mecca of economic growth and the, and the engine of economic growth that it once was. And, I, and, and certainly there's concerns there on the political side. So I've got to look for a place to place capital. Middle Easterns are saying, you know, obviously there's a hotbed of, of you know, geopolitical risks in the Middle East today. They're looking for a place to, pl- to place their capital. Um, and, you know, divisive, what I would call divisive politics or, or, or volatility in the politics in the U.S., you know, is, is pushing capital away from the U.S. Not, not completely, but to some extent is diverting some level of capital investment away from the U.S. Canada is increasingly becoming, you know, a bit of an island. And I hate to say it, but as the rest of the world sort of deteriorates, which is, again, sad to say, but as the rest of the world deteriorates or experiences heightened volatility uh, and heightened risk, Canada is becoming an increasingly important part of the econo- of, of, of a place to place your economic future. Um, and, we, and we're seeing it. 2023 is the largest year on record for foreign capital investment in Canada. We had 10 and a half in real estate, $10.5 billion last year of foreign right. capital in Canada in real estate, which is unprecedented. That's not coincidence. That's not coincidence. That's because, you know, others are looking at the rest of the world saying, you know what, Canada, like, Maybe a little slow growth, GDP per capita is shrinking. Maybe you know, a bit boring. We, but, maybe but. a bit boring. We don't love you know tough regulations, tough you know long timelines. Like a, a lot of there's a lot of stuff we're doing wrong here. Don't get me wrong. Okay, a lot of stuff to complain about. Despite all that, others see us as a place that's stable, quiet, safe, with you know a lot of reason to be optimistic. So ima- so on the heels of that, imagine if we had a government, I don't want to get too political in this discussion, but imagine if we could sort out all the things we're doing wrong and do them right. Imagine if we could figure out how to get our resources out of the ground. Right. Imagine if we could figure out how to cut our spending and get our budgets and deficits back in order. Imagine if we can figure out or get to a point where our interest rates actually start coming down. Imagine if we could figure out a, a, a sound immigration policy that brings construction workers in and nurses and doctors in and you know educators in. Imagine if we can you know, figure out uh, how to how to cut down on the timelines to get permits to do things. Or, you know, like, imagine if we could start to actually figure out how to do all of these things properly, how unbelievably powerful this economy could be. And how I, I'd vote for you. Well, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't vote for myself. But, <laughs> but, but you know, so, so but the, me- the message right. is, you know, like we, despite all of the stuff we're doing wrong, we're still attracting sure. foreign capital. Someone else in the world is saying Canada is the place I'm going to put my money. Imagine how good we have it or would have it if we got all the things we're doing wrong right. And we'll get there. We're going to get there. And, you know, it'll take some time. Eventually, we'll shake this thing out. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sort through some of these headwinds. But, at the, but my firm belief is that we've got the underpinnings of, of, of some major macro tailwinds that for real estate are really promising. And for all those reasons, I'm super optimistic about where we'll get to in the fullness of time as the interest rate story becomes a little more constructive. And that could be mid this year, late this year, next year, I don't know. But in the meantime, lease your space, invest in your buildings, make sure your tenants are happy, do all the things, the rest will take care of itself. Which which are the asset classes or most of those foreigners looking at these days? Is it still industrial that's the hottest or is there's... There's a bit of everything. I mean, if you look look last year, um, you know, a couple of big deals. I mean, TPG did the big deal with Oxford in industrial. Uh, my understanding is that an American buyer uh, has a big manu- has cap rates, big manufacturing housing portfolio under contract. Um, you know, there's been res the, for sure. There's res. I mean, uh, um, Blackstone bought the Tricon res business. Uh, now that's a largely U.S. based res business, although Tricon is Canadian, but there, a lot of their assets are in the U.S. But they have a, they have a Canadian portfolio as well. Um, so I think it's I think it's across the board. You know, I, I think it's universally. Office is today seems to be universally rejected, and you know we can talk about office Rightly if you want. Rightly or wrongly? Well, great question. So um, you know I'm firmly on the record, uh, and this just reinforces it. Now that it's being we recorded. won't tell anybody. By the way, <laughs> no one's listening. <laughs> um, you know I'm for like so so. I think there's an enormous opportunity in office, the same as I think there's an enormous opportunity in retail. I think it's nuanced. I think it's it's um, 
I look at the gap between investment sentiment. So how much do people want to buy the assets and what's happening at the operating level? And if I look at our own portfolio, which I think is a decent proxy for, for the broader market, the operating fundamentals in both retail and we own enclosed malls in retail mostly, um, and office are both fundamentally sound. So uh, in the mall space, our malls today are more occupied, we have higher occupancy today in our mall portfolio than we've ever had since our ownership of those assets. Sales are higher than they were. When we went into the pandemic, Bayshore Mall in Ottawa was doing sales around 700, 700 and change. Today, they're almost 1,000. Wow. Um, we're converting tenants that we put in there over the last 10 years on percentage rent deals and on temp deals and so on. We're converting all those to net rents. We've got guys who are paying gross rents all back to net rents. Like all those things are happening. Those are all telltale signs that the retailers are optimistic. Business is good. There's demand for the space because when there's no vacancy, you have the leverage over the tenants to do basically whatever you want. We're getting rid of the the co-tenancy clauses and the demo clauses, you know, like you're getting rid of all that stuff, that all that noise that got found its way into leases over the course of 15 years of pessimism. So retail, very solid, accelerating, and I got a lot of time for for, for retail. Um, but you're right though, Rob, because we were in at ICSC in January, mm -hmm. and we expected, you know, you go there, everything was going to be e-commerce, mm -hmm. e-commerce, e-commerce, right. and everybody had a great sentiment about retail yeah. saying the people are going back to the stores yeah uh and e-commerce has actually plateaued plateaued yeah uh, right. and we're seeing that now in the on the industrial side we're seeing vacancy rates starting to rise so i think that story about retail is dead on so that's what we're experiencing in retail and your comment on industrial which i'll come back to in a second is exactly also what we're seeing um the office is nuanced um the office is a bifurcated market and that's really playing itself out. And, you know, Arnold and I talked a little bit about this earlier offline. The good, at, what I'll call the good assets are performing actually really well. The tougher assets, B and C class office assets are having a tougher time. And I think those challenges will continue to unfold. But my point is, if you look at, again, the gap between, no one wants any office. They're, they're painting all office with exactly the same brush. So they're yep. saying, I don't, like, I don't care what the office built. I don't care where it's located, how good it is, who the tenants are, what the Walt, you know, what the average lease term is. I don't care about any, what the rents are. I don't care about the price per square foot. I don't want to buy it. I don't want to lend on it. I don't want to, you know, like, I don't want to touch it. So just don't even talk to me. That's the attitude of office. Well, if you compare that investment sentiment to what's happening at the asset level, like what's happening on the leasing side, you say, geez, that's quite a gap. That's quite a misperception. So I think of that as being the opportunity. I mean, that's to me, that's the ARB. That's the arbitrage, right? Where you can understand what's happening and you say to yourself, the, the, the risk, the operating risk is being mispriced at the asset level, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the opportunity. Retail is exactly the same thing. Now, retail is better than it was because it's coming off a decade of basically no liquidity. And you look back on 2023, we had three regional malls trade. We haven't seen three regional malls trade, I, I don't know, 10 years, 12 years, like that. Um, you know, LaSalle bought half of um, Vaughn Mills. Right. Uh, uh, Primaris bought, I think, Halifax from Imco. And Primaris bought Connors Stoga from, I think, Cadillac. Maybe Ivanhoe, one of the two. Um, you know, three big regional mall trades to three sophisticated buyers. We haven't seen that happen in so long. Why? Because there's buyers out there that recognize exactly what I'm talking about. They're saying, well, look, like... Uh, I got a whole portfolio of malls and I'm leasing all, there's no vacancy. I'm leasing every space that comes up for, for lease, I'm leasing. So like, why am I paying a seven cap for a mall? Like if I can lease, and, and versus a four cap for an industrial building. Right. And now vacancy in industrial is also like non-existent, although it's higher today than it was, right? It was 1% today, it's 3%. Well, it went from nothing to something. Went from nothing to something. But the, the so I would look at industrial today as being the opposite. I think there's, more optimism in industrial than there is um, than there is on the. I think the operating side is softening. I mean, that's un not everyone's admitting that the operating side is softening, but the investment appetite hasn't yet softened. So to me, that's that's a seller's market, right? Res 
res is a complicated one because you've got other things at play in res like rank control and so on and so forth so you've got a lot of other things playing itself out in res that is that you have to sort of like think about so so what we're finding in res is that vacancy non-existent right and, and i'm talking about in the core markets sure. toronto even montreal vancouver in the old what i'd call vintage res um you know no vacancy uh you know like rock solid fine undersupplied over demand like we all know the story in res the challenge with res in particularly in the rent controlled buildings is that as the gap between what tenants are paying and what market rent is as that gap grows so as market rents accelerate and rent controlled rents stay you know relatively modest that gap grows as that gap grows fewer and fewer fewer and fewer tenants move out of the buildings which means there's a lot of pressure on NOI growth so NOI growth in the, what I call again the vintage rent controlled res buildings uh, is quite is quite modest. So you've got operating expenses growing, gross rents obviously, and you have very little top line growth. So despite the fact that you that you can buy these buildings at a fraction of replacement cost and you know like they're well well located and there's no vacancy, the the, the opportunity to generate generate outsized returns from income growth. There's a lot of pressure on that. And we're seeing turnover in our portfolio has gone from, in the old days, 20% a year rolling over. So it allows you to capture a lot of upside to today it's single digits. Today it's 7%, 8%. I mean, it's right. cut, it's, 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 it's more than half. Yeah. And that has the biggest impact on NOI growth is turnover. It's not where market rents are going. It's, it's all about turnover. It's all about getting access to market rents. If you can't get access to the market rents, you know, the income growth is really quite Well, and modest. given the amount of construction that's going on right now, that turnover may becomes even more, more, more difficult. Yeah, there, there's, uh, there's not as much in, in the, in the context of the broader market and the, and the shortfall of demand, there's still not a lot of new development going on um but if you're going to invest in res if i you know if we're going to place a dollar in in res today to me you're better off investing it in new in new assets whether that means building from the ground up or you're buying a, an asset that has you know recently been built outside of rent control that to me is a better despite the fact that the rents are closer to market you're paying more per unit and so on i like that bet better I think also the last thing I'll say on this is with with the vintage residential is that when you combine the modest NOI growth with increasing capital requirements, because these right. buildings are all old, you got to replace the chiller, you got to do the balconies, you got to do the garage, you got to do the roof, you got to do the windows, you know, all this stuff over and over and over again, um, you know, can put a lot of pressure on cash flow. So in a day, in an age where we've got heightened, elevated interest rates, low rent growth, you know, tough tough tight cash flow. I don't know, like to me, that's a tough set of facts, despite the fact that the supply demand dynamics are so compelling. So I, I, I tend to agree with what you just said, and especially when you mentioned before about, you know, we're probably six months of rock and roll uh, in, in the economy. But I think there are some great uh, tailwinds right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think immigration is, is mm -hmm. definitely a, a huge one because mm -hmm. one, we have to house these people. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to house them. You have to give them a place to shop. Stuff. They buy stuff. They work somewhere. <laughs> you know, like yeah. they so, they get Amazon delivered to their doorstep. So they need a you know you need a warehouse. I mean, like we're growing at somewhere between half a million and a million people a year, depending on you know what numbers you're looking at. So I, that's why I do believe that if we even if we just look at from you know what our specialty is on the industrial side, you know I you know we see that that vacancy tipping up, but I think we're going to hit hit peak vacancy by this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're going to start seeing more and more product being, you know, hopefully the interest rates will come down, mm -hmm. spur on the economy. I agree with you, by the way, when you say about having a strong 20, end of 2024. Mm -hmm. And I think that by 2026, we're going to be back in a space crunch in industrial. Okay. You know what? I'll, uh, well, let's see. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in industrial. Um, I think you're right. I mean, they are, I would say the fundamentals are, are plateauing. I don't think they're, they're collapsing by any, Definitely not. By, yeah. by any stretch. I mean, it's rock, rock, rock solid. Like we've got, you know, great operating fundamentals in that space, but I'm just, I'm, I'm sort of, I see there's a, there's, there's just more optimism than there, you know, there's just more optimism than there is operating strength just by a little bit just like by the a little investment bit. appetite hasn't caught up to the reality i, I of what's feel happening. like that right. i feel like that and and that happens like things are going to ebb and flow right and you know the investment the investment sentiment will always trail the fundamentals in both directions in both right. directions right. and so i just think today 
there's an enormous opportunity in retail and office because the investment sentiment is so far behind the operating fundamentals. So if I had to place a dollar today, you know, look, could you would you buy would you buy a triple A office building um, at a I don't know a six cap? Would you buy an A class office building at a six cap, or an industrial building with market rents at you know at a five or a four seventy five? I don't know. I mean, that's. I mean, look, tough question. Um, you know, given everything, I, I'd probably be leaning towards the office space right now. You might be. Yeah. You might be. Now, the market is not. Agreed. The market Agreed. is not. So, you know, maybe it's not a six, maybe it's a six and a half. I don't, I, like, I don't know. Like, I'm, you know, we're just throwing out numbers. But I mean, ultimately, I love the idea of buying high cash flow intensity assets that I think have a strong leasing future. So, I mean, if you if you take that one step further, the strongest part of the market today on a risk return basis is probably credit, right? Because the whole credit, and we haven't talked about the credit side, but the credit side of the business today is where everyone's placing their capital because they're saying, oh, I'm taking less risk. I can generate higher returns, higher cash flow returns. And that's a very compelling place to be invested today. So, you know, like we're seeing that our, our debt funds have performed very, very well over the last couple of years. We did in our high yield fund, we did 14 and a half percent last year in our senior that's mortgage excellent. fund, which is first mortgages, we did, you know, almost 9.9%. We did almost 10%. And that's cash return. That's not, we're not marking mortgages to market or anything. That's cash return in your pocket. And, you know, that's net of fees, net of everything. Um, you know, like that, those will be the strongest returns in our business in 2023, even though, even compared to the equity side, which in theory should be generating higher returns than the credit side. That's sort of where our world is today. So it's confusing. There's a lot of stuff going on, but ultimately, again, it comes back to do all the things right at the asset level, you know, make sure your organizations, you know, you obviously got to do everything right at the people level, make sure everyone's, you know, in the right place, doing the right things and with the right attitude and the core set of values. But, you know, on the operating side, Make sure you're doing all the right things with the assets. The rest, it'll sort itself out. So I, I think I think that's a, a great a great uh, place to uh, to conclude today. Okay. I think uh, I think you know we're hearing Rob not to paraphrase, but the kind of the Canadian economy is solid mm -hmm. uh, at at the base. Mm -hmm. You know we got some we got some uh, a bit of rock and roll to live through, but that things are good. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like what you're talking about. You know, taking care of the assets, and I think now's the the right time to do that. So, um, you know, on behalf of Arnold and I and Collier's Talks and uh, Wine and Warehouses Podcast, we want to thank you for taking the time. And you know, it's not easy to get uh, you know somebody, especially somebody like yourself who's being pulled in every direction right now to sit down and drink wine with us at 10 30 in the morning so <laughs> you know what it's uh no I'm, I'm flattered to have been invited so thank you and uh you know king set's relationship with colliers has been an amazing foundational part of the success of our business um, and we are grateful for all of the service the help the advice the support uh, we've had throughout the colliers organization in 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 every office across the country over the years and we have done a lot of business together um, and it's been great, you know, to be a part of that. I always love doing these kinds of things. This is, it's never hard to talk about yourself. So like anytime someone wants to just ask me about myself, I'm always happy to, you know, provide a few words, as you can tell, not short on that. Um, and the wine was phenomenal. Excellent. So it's never difficult to be in Montreal. I love it here. And, uh, cheers. Well, cheers to that. Looking forward to being back. All Thank, right. Thanks, Rob. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Collier's Talks podcast. To learn more about Collier's Canada, our experts and our solutions, visit colliercanada.com or find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook.